Negative mass. It's a concept that appears in some exotic theories of physics, often as a possible way to create a warp drive or a stable wormhole. But what would it actually look like if you had some? If you try to figure out how negative mass would behave in everyday situations, you keep running into contradictions. Like, if you pushed on a negative mass block, it would move backwards through your hand. In the previous video, I simplified the concept of negative mass down to the most basic Physics 101 level to see how it would behave in collisions. This is a little different from how you might be used to doing physics. Not starting out by understanding the qualitative concepts, but just plugging negative numbers into the equations to see what happens. In that video, I showed that by plugging negative numbers into the equations for ideal collisions, you get results that are weird, but not contradictory. Blocks move the wrong way, sometimes they even divide by zero, but they don't pass through each other. But the problem with negative mass is that it moves in the wrong direction specifically in response to forces. And you're not actually looking at forces if you model the collision as a perfect instantaneous bounce. Collisions of real objects happen because they deform and push off each other. Elastic forces are in play, and we still haven't figured out how to apply forces to negative mass without a contradiction. How can we solve this? To calculate how real blocks collide, you'd have to figure out things like Young's modulus and the coefficient of restitution and stuff like that, and that's too complicated. At least, it's too complicated for a basic thought experiment where we're still trying to figure out how things work. But there's an easier way. Instead of looking at the behavior of elastic blocks, we can model them as rigid blocks attached to springs. This applies the same elastic forces in a more familiar setting, which we do indeed learn how to solve in Physics 101. First of all, let's just see how a mass behaves when you attach it to a spring. For a positive mass, this may be familiar to you. It's simple harmonic motion. According to Hooke's law, a spring exerts proportionally more force the farther you push it from equilibrium. So when the block slides one way, the spring pulls it back the other way in a regular oscillation. The mathematical equation for this is f equals minus kx, where k is the spring constant and x is the displacement from equilibrium. And of course, f equals ma. Or more properly, f equals m dv dt. We can solve the differential equation to find out the block's motion, and it turns out to be a sine function. What if the block has a negative mass? That's simple enough. You just have to add an extra minus sign to the equation, f equals ma equals plus kx, taking the absolute value of the mass. Except now, when you solve the equation, you don't get a sine function anymore. You get an exponential. The farther the spring stretches, the harder it pulls back. But negative mass moves the wrong way in response to forces, so it just keeps going until the spring snaps. That could be a problem. In fact, that would lend credence to the original shooting through the earth problem from the previous video. But wait, this isn't the whole story yet. We are still dealing with an idealized case. This is a massless spring. It adds no inertia of its own to the motion. For that matter, it's frictionless too. It exerts a spring force, but it's lossless otherwise. How do you deal with a spring that has mass? Well, to really do it right, you'd have to figure out the forces on each little segment of spring and integrate over them, and you can probably derive a formula for an effective mass of the system or something, but that's still too complicated. We only need to figure it out on a conceptual level. And for that, we can still build a working model out of Physics 101 pieces. This is a setup that I actually don't remember seeing in Physics 101, because it would be kind of redundant there, but you can solve it using the same techniques. We're going to use a block on a spring that is pushing another block. This is equivalent to approximating all of the spring's mass being at the end of the spring, but it also lets you do something else. The original question was how you can push on a negative mass and not have it go backwards through your hand. Well, here you can take the positive block as your hand, 
and the spring as your arm extending to give a push. This way, we can have the spring push on a positive mass, so we have a better idea of how it operates. Except, we're still trying to push a negative mass with a rigid object here. You may be wondering what good this does. I could solve the negative block on a spring because I could plug negative numbers into the differential equation, but with this model, we're back to the problem of what happens if you give it a continuous push just with another block, which was what we were trying to find in the first place. To get out of this circular logic, we're going to use a little trick to turn that continuous push into a series of elastic collisions, something we already know how to solve for negative mass. We'll start with two positive blocks for now. First, displace the blocks away from equilibrium, so that the spring will give them a push. But then, displace the first block a little farther, so that there's a gap between them. The first block will be pushed forward and hit the second block at some non-zero speed. Calculate the result of the elastic collision. The second block will start moving forward, and the first block will bounce back. But the spring will push it forward again so that it will eventually catch up and collide again. This will repeat until the second block has enough speed and distance that the first block doesn't catch up anymore. Now make that initial gap between the blocks smaller. The collisions will happen closer together and at a lower relative speed. Our hope is that if we take the limit as the size of the gap approaches zero, we'll get the same result as the continuous push. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what happens. I don't know if this is an established technique or anything, but it works. If you take the limit, the equation is exactly the same as if the blocks start out touching. At least, it works when I play them side by side. To actually prove it mathematically would be a little more complicated, so I'll leave that as an exercise to the viewer. So we've established a way to convert a continuous push to a series of elastic collisions, which still gives the same result as before. What happens if we plug negative numbers into it? And as in the last video, we're just assuming that elastic collisions still work with negative masses. There are two cases here. The first is when the negative block is smaller than the positive one, and the second is when the negative block is larger than the positive one. Remember that divide by zero error from last time? The masses can't be equal and opposite or the math breaks, so we have to check what happens on either side of that line. If the negative block is smaller, then things look close to normal. Just as with a single elastic collision, the negative block is pushed away. It doesn't go the wrong way. But the larger positive block doesn't slow down like it's supposed to. It speeds up and stretches the spring farther than it did in the case with two positive blocks. And if the masses are close to equal and opposite, just as we saw with single collisions, the effect is more extreme. Remember that in the last video, we made a hypothesis that normal forces on a negative mass are reversed. That is, they pull into the surface instead of pushing away from it. That seems to be what happens here. The positive block stretches the spring farther because the normal force is pulling it forward, instead of pushing it back. This means that if you push on a small negative block with your hand, you will be able to push it normally, except you will feel your hand unaccountably pulled forward. It's not sticky or anything, you can still pull your hand back, but you will feel the block pulling on it instead of pushing. And you can do similar things with other forces like friction and gravity, and it still works out. I'll probably make a bonus video about that. Now let's look at the case where the negative mass is larger than the positive one. I saved this one for last because this is the weird one. This time, the spring isn't pushing the negative block away. The negative mass is coming towards it, compressing it further. This looks like that exponential motion we saw with only a negative mass. But that's not right. We seemed to have established that normal forces are reversed with negative mass, but now they're back to pointing their original direction again. What gives? Looking at the math, it seems to matter if the sum of the two masses is positive or negative. You'd never notice this in the real world because there it's always positive, but now we've lost that guarantee. If the total mass is positive, then the negative mass exerts a negative force, which does make a sort of sense. But if the total mass is negative, then apparently it flips again back to a positive force. But how can the normal force reverse directions like that, just by changing one of the masses without flipping its sign? 
it's that divide by zero thing again. Let's go back to the basic elastic collision. With instantaneous elastic collisions, we can't define the force in a meaningful way, but we can define the impulse, which is just the change in momentum. Normally that's force multiplied by time, but here it's instantaneous. Start with a small negative block as the target. At the moment of collision, the positive block transfers a negative amount of momentum to it, making them both accelerate to the right. That momentum transfer is the impulse. If we make the negative block larger, so that it approaches being equal and opposite to the positive one, the impulse increases. This is because, with the total mass being smaller, the whole system needs to move faster to conserve kinetic energy. In fact, the impulse increases hyperbolically. As the sum of the two masses approaches zero, the resulting speeds grow to infinity, and so does the impulse. Once the negative block becomes larger than the positive one, the impulse can't be greater than infinity, so it has to flip around and come back the other way. If the negative block is larger, it does move in the wrong direction. So, a negative mass block would indeed accelerate backwards, pushing along any positive masses that are in its way, but only if they're smaller. Things that are too small to play the immovable object to the unstoppable force. If it encounters a positive mass that's larger than itself, it will stop and bounce off the other way. So a negative mass isn't going to be punching through walls or the ground. Except, you're probably thinking now that this still doesn't work for real objects. Since real objects can deform, is it really the whole mass that's going to the calculation, or just the part that's in direct contact? Or the part that's in direct line of the force? If you rest a negative mass block on the ground, it's certainly not going to be the whole Earth pushing back on it. It'll just be that patch of ground. But how large a patch? Presumably, it would depend on how stiff the ground is. And what if you put it on soft ground? Would it punch through then? This is not Physics 101 or Physics 102. In fact, I don't think this is physics class at all. It's structural engineering. It all comes back to what I said at the end of the last video. This whole time, we've been talking about normal forces. But normal forces aren't magic. They're caused by electrons. And this is tough, because it's not clear how to even build negative mass atoms with electromagnetism as we know it. We're getting into physics 201 now, and while that's old hat for positive mass, it's pushing my limits for negative mass, since as far as I can tell, no one's ever really investigated it before. If you know of a paper where they did study this, or better yet, if you're a physicist who's interested in this question, leave a comment or contact me. But failing that, I'm going to think about it some more and try to come up with a way for it to work. And with a bit of luck, I'll be able to do a part three about the microphysics of negative mass sometime down the road.